such words for I I just don't get it I mean I understand the why but then I really don't understand the why to that extent you know anytime there is a murder trial right they always go for the insanity plea now I'm not a psychiatrist or a therapist in this case, I, I just don't know, but it's clear that the judge and the jury wasn't having it. But I have a few things to say, so let's just get to get to. We are going to summarize this case, and then we're going to break down the trial. So, let's begin. Ohio woman stabbed own mother to death after getting kicked out of college gets life in prison. Sydney Powell, 23, was found guilty of murdering her mother, Brenda, in addition to assault and evidence tampering and sentenced to 15 years to life in prison. So, she has to serve at least 15 years before she's even eligible for parole. And that does not mean she will get out in 15 years. So, they might deny her. The Akron woman was arrested in March 2020 after she hit her mother with a cast iron skillet. after hearing this the first time, right? This this sounds like like a crime of passion, like a overkill, right? I I don't know. And the medical examiner on the trial was saying that the cast iron she was hit so hard that it actually like split her skull open and it was multiple times. And so Again, um, Sydney was arrested after she hit her mother with a cast iron skillet. First off, you know how heavy them shits are. Does anyone actually have a cast iron skillet? I should have bought mine out just to show you, like, this shit is heavy. And then stabbed her nearly 30, 30, 30 times. School officials from the University of Mount Union were on the phone with Brenda at the time of the attack and heard her screams, at which point they contacted the police. Brenda, a 50-year-old child life specialist at Akron Child Hospital, was found with critical injuries and declared dead at a local hospital. So, so far, what we learned is the daughter was 23, um, took a cast iron, hit her mother over the head, and then stabbed her 30 times while the college was on the phone with the mother. And they heard this. We're going to break all this down. Do not worry. Prosecutors later argued that Sydney killed her mother because she was afraid that would find out she had been suspended from the University of Mount Union. The then 19-year-old had poor grades but kept them a secret from her family. So let's just talk about high school real quickly. She was a good student. She had a 3.8 average. She played sports. I do believe it was either soccer or lacrosse or something. Don't remember. Don't care because it's not really relevant to the case, like what sport she played, but and she had a 3.8 average, and she got a academic scholarship to the college called University of Mount Union. She struggled her first year, and then by second year, 
knowing that she was still going to school, things were fine, she was still on campus, and yet she was actually suspended. She lost her scholarship and she was no longer enrolled. So instead of just telling your parents you dropped out or you lost your scholarship, you kill your mother while she's on the phone trying to straighten this mess out. Like I said, I understand the why she did it, but I don't understand the why. Like, I know the reason she didn't want her mother to find out that she failed out of school. But the first thing you think of is to overkill your mother. Besides, like, maybe getting a job and saving up money and and getting an apartment. Because, see, here's the thing. After she got kicked out of college, she was acting like she was going to school. But she was really staying out in motels, hotels, friends' houses, and stuff like that. Even when she got kicked out of school, signed the paperwork and everything, this girl continued to come back to the university like nothing was wrong absolutely nothing she moved back to her dorm room she attended classes and everyone was confused i think she thought that like i don't know people would forget or hopefully people wouldn't notice her i don't know but she went along she went along with this whole charade so again the only thing you thought of was to kill your mom and here's the thing, because this was me at one point. When I dropped out of school, I was afraid to tell my mom, right? Um, because I was in the same boat. I actually lost my scholarship, right? And I actually didn't tell her what was going on. And I actually told my father first. And then, um, then we told her together. And of course, she was like, well, you can't come back here. You know, she was mad. The point is, I get, like, being nervous on telling your parents, but never, ever, ever in a million years would I have thought to kill my mother. Like, I get the nervousness. Like, I, I get it because I was nervous, too. But, I don't know. Anyway. And so, like I said, um, Sydney was telling her mother what was going on, and Sydney called the university, and they were giving the mother the call back to explain the entire situation. The only thing that Brenda got out of was either hello or good morning, and then the daughter hit her over the head. So the two school authorities that were on the phone, speakerphone, saying good morning or hello to Brenda, actually heard her murder. They heard the thuds and the screams and this is and that. They heard it all. Um, the phone cut off at some point after, I would say, somewhere in the neighborhood of six or seven of those thudding sounds. So after hello, they heard the thud. Like the, and that must have been the cast iron. They heard the thudding noises about six or seven. And then the screaming continued. University officials repeatedly called the, the house back and received no answer until someone claiming to be Brenda answered. So after they're hearing this mother, the mother being attacked, right, and they're calling the house back, no answer. And then finally, someone answers, and they're trying to act like they're Brenda. It was not Brenda. I was sure it was Sydney, both Dean. His name was John Fraser. And so both of the school authorities looked at one another and sort of shook their heads. 
already suspended. It's not like you're on the fence and someone can change like the Dean's mind. You're already gone. They already kicked you out. It's already done. It's done. So for you to go this extra mile, why? I And I have to say everyone, even not that a family, friend, school, everyone said Brenda and Sydney had a really close relationship. She had no, um, no outbursts, no signs of violence or, or anything like that. No abuse, no nothing. She was, like I said, she had friends. She was liked. She had a 3.8 average. She was in sports. She got a scholarship to college. And every like, that's why I'm saying, like, I don't get it. They People say they were, like, glued to the hip, but they were so close. And then you go do this. I, I, I don't know. When police arrived on the scene, it appeared that Sydney had attempted to make it look like a break-in gone wrong. She allegedly broke a window and told police that an intruder um, came in to attack her. Experts from the defense argued that Sydney was suffering from schizophrenia and didn't know the difference between right and wrong. See, that's where I have to stop. You see, the, the mental health is, it's, ah, it's a touchy topic because you can sit there and tell us, right? And that she didn't know the difference between right and wrong. But see, she did. But she did. But she absolutely 100% did. You know why? Because remember, at one point, she was trying to act like her mother. So she knew what she was doing. And then, um, she tried to act like there was an intruder in the house. She then tried to act like the intruder broke in, which she used her fist. And actually, I think she broke the back window, but the police realized that too. So, you didn't know right from wrong, but you knew you were going to get in trouble. So, you start, like, making up an excuse. You start tampering with evidence. You start lying. But you don't know right from wrong. So if you don't know right from wrong, why are you lying? You are lying because you know you would get in trouble. That's knowing right from wrong. See, I'm not saying she doesn't have schizophrenia. I'm not saying that at all. What I'm saying is in this particular situation, don't give me that bullshit because she, she was tampering. And she was trying to do what I, I can't. Absolutely not. Um, and then the, the family asked for leniency during the sentencing because of Sydney's mental health. Alright, so that is the base of the story. And I have to say, though, her family, especially her father, has been, you know, trying his hardest. He's trying, you know, he's trying. I, it's, it's, it's really a fucked up situation because you have a father who lost his wife from his daughter, but then he's also about to lose his daughter because of his wife. It's, it's really weird, but even down to those last breath, he was, you know, pleading with people, asking people to, to be lenient. He was like, he had nothing but good to say about his daughter, his wife, and the relationship, but something, like, I felt as if, though, during that trial, there was something that, that was bothering him, but he didn't quite come out and say what it is, but there was something wrong about that initial morning, right? Because what happened was he was at work and they all had this app and whatever app it was, it told him that his daughter was home. He knew something was wrong because she was not supposed to be home. So instead of like picking up the phone and saying, you know, what are you doing home whenever he actually left work and like rushed home right away that to me seems suspicious because like you know if if that was 
me or like vice versa, you know, my mom be like, oh, I saw you in a video camera, why are you home? She wouldn't leave work and then he even left his phone there just to make sure that the daughter did not know that he was on his way. It's crazy. And then, you know, um, they were asking him like, what were you worried about, you know, your daughter and wife together? And the way he went around that story, I, I don't know, like I felt as if we're missing something else, but let's get to get to so this case started in it started in september 7th 2023 day one prosecutors contend sydney lied when she told police and her father that that there had been a break-in at the house so, if you look into this case, as soon as the police arrive, they have the, the, um, what do you call the police footage or whatever, the cam that they wear, the body cam. And, um, and they are coming to the house and she is hysterical. Sydney is hysterical and she is covered in blood and, um, she is, you know, the police are coming in, they're trying to calm her down, but the funny thing is, she was by the room where her mother was, and she, like, refused the police, like, she would not let them pass her, she would not let the police in the door, she kept trying to basically push them back out, like, guide them back out, but the police was like, no, you know what, enough outside, and then she told the police that there was a break-in and that her mother told her to run. So she ran. And then the next thing you know, uh, the intruder came in and attacked her or, or some nonsense. I don't listen. This is my point. See, in my eyes, Sydney did not expect the police to come because she did not expect the the two college people, well, the two college, um, deans to listen to the murder. She kind of forgot about that. So I think maybe she thought she had enough time to figure out this plan, but she did not. So she comes up with this bullshit plan that there was an intruder that, that broke in and her mother told her to run. So she ran. And so the prosecutor was showing one line. And then another lie she told after deceiving her parents for months about her enrollment in Mount Union University. Body cam footage from responding officers capture a disheveled Sydney telling them that there was a noise that her mother told her to run and that when she heard her screaming she came back into the house and found her mother on the floor. Prosecutors contend she broke one of the windows in the back of the house to stage the crime scene to make it look like there was a break-in. Again, you can't sit there and tell me she didn't know right from wrong. You can't do it. Now, the defense um, contends that Sydney killed her mother, but she was in a trance of a psychotic break at the time and could not appreciate the wrongfulness of her actions. Well then, if that's the case, why did she come up with a story? Why did she lie? Why did she try to tamper with evidence? I, I don't know. And since the attack, defense attorney Donald told juries that Sydney had been diagnosed with schizophrenia and receiving treatment with good results. I don't know. The defendant's father, Stephen, took the witness stand and became emotional while identifying members of his family in the photos before they were torn apart by the murder of his wife at the hands of his daughter. That I'm telling you, that man is in what was in a fucked up 
decision really I mean I, I have to give it to him like I said till the end he was still batting for his daughter the one that torn this family apart but I I truly believe that maybe the, the father really thinks that she has like I'm not saying she doesn't have mental issues let me not say that but I I believe she knew right from wrong at that moment I don't know under direct examination by prosecutors, Powell took juries through the ordeal of learning that his daughter Sydney had been expelled from Mount University. So the father is now telling us how he found out. He said he called his wife to have her handle the crisis with Sydney, since as a child life specialist for Akron Pediatric Hospital, she was better skilled at dealing with much matters. Brenda was practiced at de-escalating, you know, traumas, emotional charge situations, and it appeared Sydney was not coping well, having lied to him about school, when in fact she had been suspended for academic failure. The father described the mother and daughter relationship as very close and that the two had an unbreakable bond. He testified that Sydney had never been violent in the past. That's what I'm saying. I, I, I don't know where to go with this case because no one in school, friends, teacher, family, no one has said she was violent, right? No one said she had a violent bone in her body. Um, the bond was very, very close. It was an unbreakable bond. It's like my mother and I, right? At the end of the day, no one can ever break our bond. We fight like everyone else. We argue, you know, but my mother is my ride or die. She's like the only person on this planet that will ride or die the way she has ride or die for me. So, um, again, I've been in this situation and I never thought for a million years of killing my mom. Of course, you know, moving out, living with my father, giving her space, giving her time. But that's not murder. Oh my god. I can't. He also testified that before Sydney told him about... Okay, he also testified that before Sydney told him about what happened, he had wondered about why the university had not withdrawn his tuition payment and that he could not log into the universal university portal to check on that payment status. So that's when the father realized something was wrong. He was like, wait a minute, the school, the college never took out my daughter's tuition. Let me log into the portal and see what's going on. But then he couldn't log into the portal either. And um, that's when he realized something was wrong. And then he asked Sydney, and she told him that it was a university error. When he finally learned the truth, he told Sydney that they would be able to work this out and that she should not run away from her problems. He went back to work, leaving before Brenda got home. And the funny thing is, that's exactly what my father said. He said, okay, well, you're out of school, you dropped out, you failed out, whichever. He said, okay, now what? It wasn't like, because things happen. And my father was like, well, you know, you can stay here for a little while until your mother, you know, cools off. But um, he said, I'm going to give you a month. I'm going to give you a month to do whatever you want. Figure it out. Cry, be upset, hang out, get it out. But after a month, I want a plan. And after a month, I realized I had no plan and I had to work. So that's exactly what I did. I went out there and got a job. And so, um, but my father was like, oh, okay, well, because at the end of the day, the only bad outcome of it is, is that you had a free ride to college and now you lost it. But there's community college you can try again. It's not the end of the world. It's not. 
Okay, the father said he later received a call from his friend Kenneth, who was also a detective, telling him that he heard police unit had been dispatched to his home and asked if everything was okay. The call prompted Stephen to call Sydney and Brenda. He agreed with the prosecutors, and when he spoke to Sydney, she became hysterical and told him that there had been a break in. Friends and co workers testified Sydney and Brenda had a very close relationship and that they were shocked when they learned Sydney is being charged with murder and her mother's death. Now, let's back this shit up for a second. This is what I'm saying. So, again, they were on the phone with the school, the deans. The deans heard something going on. They heard the struggle, the screams, you know, then Sydney trying to get back on the phone and act like her mother, the deans weren't having it, they knew something was wrong, they knew it was Sydney, Sydney hung up the phone, now the two deans from the university was like, "Uh uh-uh, something ain't right, they called the police, now when they called the police, the father's friend is a detective, and the detective must have been in the car or whatever, and heard the dispatch of that address and called the father was like hey i just heard that you know the police are going to your house is everything okay you know and i know that for a fact that shit happens do you know how many times i know this is my true crime dear so many of you might not be in my ramble but my brother-in-law is a detective himself back in my reckless days do you know how many times this man heard my license plate over <laughs> the dispatch or like that time um um my condo almost caught on fire um yeah so that is a thing they do hear stuff like that because yeah and so anyway his friend was like yeah they're the police is heading to your house so what does the father do he calls the house sydney picks up and he's like what's going on and she's claiming nothing's going on whenever he's like oh well you know <laughs> well the police are on their way and that's when she completely lost it got hysterical um so she wasn't expecting the police to come that fast you know so now she has to think fast and you know so that was day one on september 7th on day two september 8th two mount union school officials testified that they heard what sounded like an attack while they were on the phone with the defendant's mother brenda and then a minute or so later sydney answered their call back posing as her mother Michelle, um, Gaffney, and John Fraser, two school officials from Mount Union University, where the defendant had been going to school, testified that Sydney was suspended after she failed three or four of her classes in the fall semester of December 2019. Sydney, however, continued to attend sorority meetings and classes despite receiving written notice of her expulsion, promoting uh, Michelle and John to meet with her personally to inform her that she would need to move out her she would need to move out of her dorm and her access key card would be terminated. <laughs> now you have to understand something. Sydney knew exactly what's going on know how much paperwork you have to sign when you get kicked out of school or if you drop out it's not that simple you it's not you're like signing your life away it's just not a piece of paper and bye-bye it, it's not that simple and so she had to sign a lot so she was definitely definitely informed of what was going on. So, in December, they told her not to come back, blah, 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 that she would need to move out. The school administry said that Sydney understood that she had to move out, but refused their help in discussing her suspension with her parents and told them that her parents were aware of the 
situation. Now that's weird because, well, I guess every school is different because Albany didn't do that. They didn't say, well, we need to inform your parents or, or nothing. The only thing they said was sign here. You will get a copy in the mail and that was fucking that. It was only after um, Sydney's third meeting with them on February 24th that she then did move out. So here's the thing, right? So this is what's happening. So in December, she was supposed to move out, right? She actually came back to her dorm and moved back in. She came back to the same dorm, everything. After signing her paperwork in December, you know, the kids go home for Christmas break and they come back. I think they have a month off and then we come back to school like the end of February, um, excuse me, the end of January. When Sydney came back, she knew she was expelled, but she came back, put all her shit in, decorated her room, and she actually went to class. This girl was acting like she didn't fail. She wasn't suspended. None of it. She continued on with life, and she was going to sorority meetings, classes, and people are like, wait a minute, but you're not on our, our registry for this for this semester, you're not signed up, so, but she was just going about business, hoping that nobody would know, right, and so again, after the third meeting with her on February 24th, that she then moved out, they had enough, like enough, she was giving them excuses or whatever, on March 3rd, the school received a call from Brenda, wanting to discuss Sydney's suspension, so by now, Sydney was living, she was acting like she was going to school, living out of motels, friends' houses, and everything else. I guess she ran out of money and finally came home. That's the morning that the father saw that she came home, rushed home, and was like, what are you doing here? The father kind of knew what was going on because of the payment. Um, he was like, we got to tell your mother. Your mother can handle this. And that's when... Um, the mother came home to talk to her and the mother automatically got on the phone to see what she can do, what they can do. Now, it's clear that she probably had a partial scholarship because the father still had to make payments. So it wasn't completely free, but we all know college is expensive and a partial scholarship is better than nothing. Excuse me. winter is not playing anyway um and so yeah so like i said so the mother now knows everything that's going on the mother tried to call the university to see what they can do or you know what the actual situation is um they testified that they called brenda oh yeah as they testified that they called Brenda the mother, and soon after greeting one another, they heard repeated thuds and screaming. The sounds were alarming. Both testified that it sounded like an attack. Frazier testified that about a minute and a half after the ruckus and the call ended, he tried to call back, and on the third attempt, Sydney answered the phone pretending to be her mother. She hung up after they called her out, and they promptly called the police to the home. On cross, John testified that Brenda appeared calm and did not appear to be in a mess of an argument with Sydney, and agreed that assault took him off guard. That's what I'm saying. Like, maybe this was mental health at the spur of the moment. It's like, you know, the father wasn't even that mad. The mother is like, okay, well, let's see what we can do. Um, it, they're even saying that the mother sounded calm. She didn't sound angry. It didn't seem as if, like, the two were fighting. Maybe because the mother didn't know the extent of what was going on. And Sydney could not deal with the fact that her mother would hear that she's a failure. So instead of the school letting the mother know what happened, she struck the mother before the mother actually knew the truth, which is really sad. Um, okay, 
so like I said, it took them off guard, like what the fuck? The attack on Brenda was violent. She suffered at least 23 to 30 stab wounds, mainly to her neck and several blows to the back of her head, which caused the skin of her scalp to be broken. Pictures of her wounds taken at all times, they also showed cuts and bruising to her face, arms, and hands. Forensic pathologists concluded that she died because of multiple blunt and sharp forces, force injuries. And I know at one point people were saying, oh, well, she was, she was so tiny compared to her mother. Listen here, if you're going to take a cast iron and hit someone over the head, they're not going to be at their full strength. They're going to be confused and pain, um, more confusion, like what is going on.
bruises on her hand proved that she was the one that broke the glass, and I think she broke the glass on the wrong, on the wrong side, or something. I don't know. And like I said, she claimed the mother told her to get out. Sydney claimed she ran out, but then when she heard the mother screaming, she decided to run back in to see if she can help. The friend defense attorney played for jurors a match of Sydney's behavior after police arrived on the scene. She was erratic and hysterical initially, but then when Okay, but when she was taken out and she was in cuffs and put on the ground, she laid there in a fetal position like she was in a coma and appeared unable to respond to questions. Sydney had pled not guilty by reason of insanity. Like I said, I understand people snap. Maybe that's what happened on this one. She just snapped. I don't... I don't know. All right, so um, on day four, they decide to bring in the psychologists, right? Experts. So now we're on day four, September 13th, 2023. The first several psychology experts who, evalu who evaluated Sydney took the witness stand to tell jurors that Sydney was experiencing a psychotic break and could not appreciate the wrongfulness of her actions when she bludgeoned and stabbed her mother to death. Here's the problem though. It's not like she used one weapon, right? It's not like she was like chopping up something and was like, ah, I can't take it and just started like she used two different weapons, a cast iron and a fucking knife. Oh, she thought about this shit. No, like I said, if people snap, they snap whatever they have in their hand. Like, shut up. They don't like, you know, whatever. But she used two different. I just wanted to point that out. Um, then Dr. James evaluated Sydney in the fall of 2021. So there was one in March in the 2021 and diagnosed her with schizophrenia and major depressive disorder. Doctor told Sydney that she did not recall the attack and only remembered flashes. Her last memory of her mother was that they were sitting on the couch and she was comforting her. She recalled going up and down the stairs of the basement wanting to get away. According to the doctor, that was the extent of the... Okay, this is bullshit. Let me tell you why. I don't even, I, th th this doesn't even make any sense. <laughs> because if she's claiming that the last memory she had was with her mother, right? She said the last memory is that they were sitting on the couch and she was being comforted by her. Her mother was comforting her, right? Oh, it's okay. We got this. We got this. But then if that's the case and your mother and father had your back if that's the last memory then why is it when your mother called the school before the school can speak you killed her so if your mother knew everything why were you mad that she was on the phone to school it doesn't make any sense it, it doesn't not to me anyway and if she they were sitting on the couch and your mother was comforting you why would you want to get away why are you pacing back and forth like i don't i don't um the doctor testified that sydney was deteriorating and losing her grip on reality in the three months leading up to the attack her lies to her parents about being enrolled in classes when she was actually suspended were an alternate reality that she lived because her failure was inconsistent with how she viewed herself. Therefore, she denied what was really going on in her life, hoping she could make the falsehood a true reality. See, that's what I believe. I, I believe, like, that I, I do understand that because for you to sit there and sign all that paperwork, have to give in your, your room key and everything else, you have to move out and then you come back, move your shit back in and then go to classes knowing you've been kicked out like 
like you were hoping that no one would notice or you were hoping that nobody would see you I'm not sure what you were hoping to be honest I don't I guess you know she was hoping that everything would just go away I I don't know and then the next memory she has is she was in a hospital I don't buy it examination another doctor agreed that it was a rare it was rare that sufferers of schizophrenia act out violently and even rarer still that such patients report symptoms before the age of 13 that's my point besides anxiety because she didn't want to do a school project in high school nobody else said that you had any violent outburst you weren't a troublemaker. You were never in trouble with the law. You had a 3.8 average. I honestly don't know what happened. And you know, I think sometimes the pressure of school, because like for me, what happened to me? I had an academic scholarship, but college is a little bit different, you know, than high school. And your first year away, it's like you're still trying to learn. You, you, you haven't learned how to have fun and work at the same time, right? You haven't learned how to study and go out and still be responsible. Like, you haven't figured all out that yet, right? It's like you're in college and you have all this freedom and can literally do whatever you want. But in the back of your mind, you're forgetting that you have to go to school too. You know, um, and then there's some students who can't keep up. Like, I think for some people, and this is a God honest truth, that many people cannot universities because it's just way too big and I agree I when I went back to school for medical I actually enjoyed the smaller classes compared to like having a class in an auditorium when you're only a number like in Albany there were classes we had like over 200 students like we were in an auditorium like literally rocked around just chilling you know so teachers don't care so it is like easy to slip away and it is easy to just like get yourself deeper and deeper into academic hell but um anyway and so but my point is that no one has seen any outburst um any like mental health they're trying to say she has it usually starts before the age of 13 the doctor had noted in the assessment Sydney told him that she had experienced all audible hallucinations when she was at the age of 11. The doctor agreed that schizophrenia does not give one a pass and then commission of a crime. Right, so um, unless you're really disturbed, I don't know. And then they also proved that some mental health professionals who saw Sydney in the days following the murder did not rule out. Um, they also noted in her hospital record that she initially said that she had... See, she's playing. Okay, there's also a note in her hospital record that she initially said that she had no memory of who had stitched her up. But then later recall that a male resident stitched her up. And then the doctor said the most relevant evidence was the attack itself, all taking place within 3.5 minutes. The start of the incident marked by the phone call to Brenda at 12.36. And then the follow-up phone call in which Sydney answered, pretending to be her mother at 1240. The doctor testified that the lack of motive and brutality of the attack were all factors that suggested that Sydney was in a psychotic break. She was in something. Like I I I, I don't know. I can't think some I something triggered this girl. But you can't go from like nobody knowing you had illnesses to no violent outbreak. 
why you snapped, but I don't know. I, I don't know because for you to snap like that, like, okay, like back in my days, like, like after like my attack, right? I can see where people would wait for me to snap. I was snappable, right? I had reasons to be snappable, but no one is giving a reason here on why she snapped. Nothing leading up to it. Nothing. I I don't know. Like I said, I, I don't like talking about people's mental health, but anyway, doctors think at that moment she was in the middle of a psychotic break. But then on the cross, the prosecutors pointed to two significant events during the 3.5 minutes attack. Number one, Sydney had the presence of mind to go outside of the house to break the window and later tell cops that an intruder was to blame. And I didn't even know what and she used two different weapons. See, I didn't even know they were going to say that. That is my point. She used two different weapons. What I just mentioned before, if someone is pissing you off, right, and you're doing dishes, whatever is in your hand at that moment, if you snap, that's what you're going to use. You don't sit there and use two different weapons. If you snap, whether it was a back scratch or whether it was a box of fucking tissues, you take whatever you can and you just like, shut the fuck up and you snap. You don't sit there and get a... I'm over it. I'm... Um, noted that, okay, and used two different weapons during the attack, retrieving retrieving a knife after bludgeoning her mother with a gas iron frying pan. Um, then they're saying that while she had lost touch with reality, she was still trying to make sense of what was senseless and felt like she had to get away. But by the time of the attack, by the time of the attack, I don't know. And then the doctor explained that her psychotic break was one of the most severe that he had ever seen in 46 years of practice. So I feel as if this doctor was trying to be nice about the situation. Because again, you really can't question mental health, right? But it's, 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 it's extreme. It really is. Because you failed at a school. There's like bigger... I don't, I don't, I, I, get, I don't know. And then the grandmother wanted to jump in, recalling that after a few months of medication, Sydney got better, and with tweaks to her medication, she showed a marked improvement. She testified that Sydney came to live with her and continued to live on with her grandparents' farm. So, right, so after she was arrested and everything else, and, um, she was, maybe she made bail or whatever before the trial. She was actually staying with her grandparent. And, um, th she was on medication. But see, here's the thing. She had no outbreak before that. So for the grandmother to sit there and say she was improving, that means maybe there was something you're not saying. Like, improving from what? Improving from what? If, any, if everyone else is saying that she never had she wasn't violent and improving from what? Of course, someone's going to be depressed after being charged with the murder of their mother. But like, you see where I just, I just don't know. Oh, and then the teacher came forward and said that there were signs of stress that she, that Sydney did not know how to deal with stress how to cope with stress and anxiety when they were in high school. Um, and then um, they go into like the school project that she almost had a breakdown for because she didn't want to speak in front of the class. Well, that gives you a right to kill your parents. Day five, the judge noted for the record that Sydney had requested to be excused from the courtroom. Maybe it was too much for her. Day 5, September 14th. Um, the judge noted for the, for the record that Sydney had requested to be excused from the courtroom. Um, Bell agreed that this marked the first time her voice.
voice was heard in the courtroom. Oh, so I guess that like on day five she had she had enough and she actually spoke and asked the judge if she can be excused. And this was the first time that anyone in the courtroom ever even heard Sydney speak. saying how good of a student she was and this is a nod um then this is this is the incident I was talking about right there was an incident in which Sydney accompanied by a friend came to the nurse or teacher because Sydney was distressed and crying because she could not see the numbers this is the situation I was talking about she had to do a, a presentation in front of the class and she freaked out and she kept saying over and over again she could not see the numbers she could not see the numbers the situation was resolved when a teacher agreed to give Sydney a test at another time and then the teacher said she did not report the incident to school officials and that she never observed mental health issues in Sydney so I don't know Then we had a neuropsychologist testify that Sydney was out of her mind and experiencing psychosis when she attacked her mother. Okay, so now we have a Dr. Swale was asked to evaluate um, Sydney in July 2023 to determine whether she was insane at the time of her murder. After reviewing her medical records, Swell diagnosed Sydney with schizoaffective behavior disorder, bipolar type, and that she was in acute psychotic state at the time of the murder. I don't know. I just feel as if people are adding on shit to her. I, I don't know. This, this case got me more pissed off than anything because it's like they 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 had a good home. I, I don't know. And listen, I don't know. They're they're going into all all this other stuff that meant she could have been experiencing suicidal thoughts but didn't realize it see now we're just adding shit to it like um i don't know then on day 6 september 15th the defense arrested its case friday after calling two more mental health experts to the stand and they both agreed that Sydney was insane and could not appreciate the wrongfulness of her actions when she attacked her mother. Um, now, another doctor testified that Sydney's case was atypical and difficult to predict because of risk factors normally that of violence such as history of violence okay so to summarize all this he's saying that this is like the weirdest case it's difficult because all this behavior that she's showing now should have been showing when she was younger it should have been like she should have been on medication she should be having like maybe hallucinations i i i don't know but whatever he's saying it's like it's difficult to say because he doesn't want to say that she's fine but and what they're trying to label her as he's saying that but there was no evidence of of violence there was no extreme childhood trauma there was no substance abuse none of that was present in her case and then the doctor is saying so now like i said they're they're, they're having you know good versus bad doctor bad doctor so one doctor is saying that you know um it's not normal like there was there, there was no violence nothing and then someone's saying well her psychotic break began when she was summoned to the dean's office and told she had to vacate 
loosens gradually and abates over time. He said that Sydney, during moments of lucidity, texts with family and friends to hold on to some normalcy. Along with her thoughts, she would have been confused and paranoid. I don't know. Believing people were talking about her and telling her that she was not worthy. Yeah, she also said that in her head, she was hearing things like, not good enough, not good enough. But this whole act came after she was arrested and put on the ground. She was, she had this whole story about a, uh, someone broke in, this, this, and that. And then she got arrested on the ground and started hitting her head like, I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough. It's, it's like the timing for me. But again, I'm not a psychiatrist. I am not in her brain. I do not know. Um, um, so anyway, they're going back and forth trying to figure it out. People are saying no. Um, well, now they're saying she's worse because now she has PTSD, nightmares. I mean, yeah. But then how do you have nightmares, right? This is my problem. Like, what are you having nightmares about? You, you claim you don't remember killing your mother. So what exactly are you having nightmares about? You see where the struggle is for me. Nightmares about what? She was living with her grandparents. She was out on bail on Medicaid. 
occasion, but see, I, 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 I can't, I can't count that because now you're on all types of medication because you have all these different experts telling you this, that, this, that, you have PTSD, but how do you have PTSD if you don't remember anything? How are you having nightmares if you don't remember anything? The last thing you said you remember was sitting on the couch with your mom and she was comforting you. So how, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know, but it's clear that the jury nor the judge believed her. Sad, 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 and more sad. Um, you can watch this whole court case unfold on YouTube, on court TV. You can sit there and watch the father's testimony, the grandmother, um, all the doctors. I will not, I mean, there were so many doctors, I'm not going through all of them. As you can see, I didn't even list them by name. I just said another doctor. And there's so many. There were so many psychiatrists that I think it was to the point that they were trying to outdo the other one. I don't know. Anyway, that is the story of Sydney Powell. Um, I, 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 I feel for the father. Um, rest in peace to Brenda, the mother. I don't. I don't know. I. I because I feel as if this murder was literally for no reason. I don't know. Anyway, guys, I love you guys for watching.